Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Welcome back. And today we're talking about why higher inventory won't crash the housing market. As a matter of fact, the exact opposite, as you are about to learn, is true. And before we get to our first point, I want to recognize all of you who have uh, just started listening to this podcast. It's kind of fascinating. We've been doing this podcast for years and years. And matter of fact, uh, this podcast has between what's available on iTunes and Stitcher and whatnot, over 2,000 podcasts ready for you to download and listen to. But also there's podcasts that are available over on timandjulieharris.com, which are, uh, there's 3,000 additional podcasts that are over there as well. So if you really want to binge, and I know some of you do, especially in the weekends or on long drives, there are your resources. Now, specifically from the last two days, Julie and I were talking about how important it is that you select and you choose wisely who you associate with, who you talk to, who you get information from during economic times, or really, I'd say just historic times like we're living in. You know, it's kind of funny. Do you remember when the historic times, the black swans were the anomalies? Like by very definition, you never see a black swan. And now it's almost like the normal times of the black swans. You know, it's almost like it's flipped. We seem to be going from crisis to crisis to crisis. And you really got to wonder how much of the crises that we're supposedly going from one to the other are actually real versus made up and imaginary to try to stoke fears and try to stoke people to think this way or that way. You know, we talked a lot about the manipulation that's happening all over uh, because of the press, because this being an election year, just all these different things. We don't get into politics on this podcast. If you're a new listener, what we do get into though, is helping you to t- uh, fine tune your own um, thinking so you can decide who you're going to listen to and who you're not going to listen to. So in the last couple of days, we've talked the impo- about the importance of making sure that you're fine tuning who you're listening to, specifically in your brokerage situation as pertains to your real estate business. Because everywhere you turn nowadays, everyone's wanting you to believe the sky is falling. Everyone's wanting you to believe that somehow it the same crap happened back in um, 07 in 08. The same crap happened back when Julie, there's been two other recessions that Julie and I coached agents through. There, you know, there was one in the you know late ninety nine, you know ninety nine two thousand two thousand one era. There were di- all these different slowdowns that have happened, and every single time, it's almost like people love to migrate towards the negative. I've always wondered why people do that, especially smart, ambitious people. Why would they would why they would embrace negative thinking? And the only reason is is because it gives them an excuse to be complacent and lazy. And that and that really is if you really cut through your own BS. That is why you look for information that's negative because it gives you a built-in excuse not to try that hard today. Uh, because if you believe tomorrow is going to be worse than today, you're not going to work that hard. And thus, you're going to make tomorrow worse than today. But Julie had a great analogy that she told me about prior to the podcast. And the essence of it was, and I've seen this happen in our house a number of times, so have you. If you have a, you know, a bowl of apples, let's say, and one of the apples is rotten and you didn't even know you had a rotten apple in there, Somehow the, the uh, what would it be, Julie? What's it called? Not the degrading of or the rotting of, really? Yeah, a rotting of? apple puts off gases that will ruin all of the good apples in a matter of days. That's right. And even if you're a banana, you're not even an apple. And the apples go anywhere near a rotting uh, apple. Or I'm sorry, a banana goes near rotting apples. It too will rot along with it. And that is exactly what happens with humans. So if you are hanging out with people, reading things, reinforcing negative thinking, I promise you, you are going to have massive regrets about that in the near future, but especially in the long-term future. Those of you who've been in the housing market long enough, or even not, think back to how some of you are still emotionally licking the, sc- the scars of the 2007 you know, economic, whatever the hell you want to call it, recession, depression, housing collapse. Choose your headline. But many agents, many humans are still licking their wounds from that psychologically, if nothing else. So you've got to have your head screwed on straight as you're entering into this downturn. This is going to be 
not as bad on housing for sure, and we're going to talk about that today with regards to this economic um, correction, collapse, whatever. I mean, we can call it what we will. Let's let's let the historian wonks choose what this you know title of this recession will be. But whatever it is that we're into now, we are going to, and we've shared a little, you know, this inflationary you know, cycle, and it's a long-term cycle. We talked a lot in the last week or so about what effect that's going to have on your life in general. But really what's important, and hopefully you're getting this from this podcast, is there's no reason to believe housing sales or really not the sales will fall, the sale prices will increase, the average commission will increase. So you might be selling fewer houses, but you're going to make more money per sale. And we're, we are um, building up to a podcast that we're hopefully going to have for you. It seems like every day we procrastinate it, Julie. We get more and more content that reinforces our theories about what's going to happen next. But we want to really give you guys a probably 10 or 15 very strong points, very drilled down research points, uh, so that you can present those to your buyers and your sellers and maybe the, your fellow real estate practitioners so they can get their heads screwed on straight. But the real bottom line is you've got to be super careful who you're allowing to positively or even adversely affect your mindset. It Because when you people are fearful, which a lot of you are being lulled into uh, you know, feeling fearful, your mind is not going to be open to learning. It's going to be op- when you're fearful, people want to go live underneath their staircase. They don't want to open their minds to opportunities. They want to close their minds to opportunities. And I'll give you an example. So Kevin Yoder, mm-hmm. who's in Michigan. Right. Great realtor, been a, was a great Remax realtor before he joined Julie and I at um, EXP. I messaged him today because I noticed that I won't say his numbers, but those of you in Icon, you know, or those of you in EXP will know what I'm talking about. He's about to hit Icon, and that's a huge accomplishment in EXP. And that's basically when you hit Icon, and we're simplifying it. EXP gives you your sixteen thousand dollar cap back in the form of EXPI stock. I'm oversimplifying it, but that's the gist of it. So he's about to hit Icon, and I was so happy for him. And I was asking him, and I already knew, I mean, frankly, because I've known Kevin for a while. I asked him, what is he doing? What's going on in his business? Because he's having a better year than even last year. He said he's been having a field day with for sale by owners. And now he's starting to work with expired listings. Ah, that's awesome. and, he, and he said that when he has worked the expired and for sale by owners before, you know, maybe 15 years ago, uh, the agent, well, he had been worked him subsequently in the past 15 years, but really when he was giving me a historical benchmark to back when he was really starting to focus on it, he said there were a lot of competitors, but he said the other agents now that he's quote unquote uh, competing with for for sale by owner and expireds and notice defaults and the rest of it, they have no skill. And he has skill. He learned his skill a long time ago. And he's an excellent prospector. So you might be, uh, I had another uh, great uh, agent who is in the um, San Francisco area, Mm -hmm. uh, Marin County, I think. Anna Fine. Mm -hmm. And Anna's having a fantastic year as well. And Anna's been getting a lot of her business from referrals, past clients, and things like that. And that business too has dried up. Mm -hmm. And so I've done my best to help her understand the path forward for her is focusing on expireds. I used her example um, a couple of weeks ago where I was explaining to you guys, she was insistent there were no expireds. And then we got into her MLS and we found out there were not just, you know, one, but there were 5,000 expireds in the prior six months. And that would have been equate to equated to just on the listing side at two and a half percent, 125 million in commission. So her mind was completely blown. You should do that the same too. You, you guys should do that same exercise as well, but understand the expired train is just loading up. Now the biggest opportunities will be over the next six to 12 months. Big picture here, Anna's going to start focusing on expireds. And all of you guys need to be doing this as well. The challenge you have is moving past the belief that what you were told to do in the past market or what you (coughs) have been doing in the past market is going to work in this new market. It actually isn't. It's not going to, it barely worked in the past market and it won't work really at all in this market. And here's the challenge you have. A lot of you have been doing the branding and the marketing, and you've been doing a lot of this you know, funnel building and all this other stuff you've been focusing on, and you've been selling houses. And you've been convincing yourself, or other people have been selling you in the belief that those are the reasons that you've been selling houses. The truth is those houses would have sold themselves because people were buying things out of fear of missing out. And sellers were selling out of fear of missing out what they thought was going to be their you know, golden paycheck from selling a house. You guys get it? That's what these ultra low interest rates did. They created an immense amount of FOMO. They made it so that even people with low skills, real estate agents with low skills could do extremely well. We're seeing that completely change now. So what will we see this year at the end of the year? Probably 25% fewer real estate transactions. What we'll also see, and we've already seen this, and Julie and I are seeing it, especially in our EXP Realty Group, is new agents, agents who are actually learning how to do the real work of real estate, finally, I might add, are the ones that are starting to kick absolute ass in real estate. 
That is where the market shifts. You guys can be successful in any market, no matter what direction the market's going. You don't have to just think, I can only be, and this is the problem that's happening in our industry right now. People are thinking, I need to do branding. I need to do marketing. I need to form a team. I need to, you need to learn skills to meet the market where it's at. That's what you need to do. You need to get your cash flow right. You need to get your skills right. You need to focus downrange on what the market is turning into, not what it was. Understand, again, really, really, really important. You can be successful in any market, provided you have the skills to be successful in that market. The skills necessary in this market are going to be real honest to God skills, not just how to make a TikTok video. That's exactly right. We were talking about this morning of all the listings that we've heard because, you know, we have coaching calls. We talk to the coaches. We, you know, always ask, where did that listing come from? What are the listings that are happening right now? They are virtually 100% highly motivated people who absolutely value a very skilled agent. Who you list with is starting to matter more and more every day. So the listings, just from my own calls, are have been people who are relocating. They have to sell. They have to buy because their job tells them to. Uh, divorce decree. Uh, let's see, relocating executives that have been on the sideline. Listen to, motivated what, type. listen to what Julie's saying. Those are not order taker type deals. Those are deals where you're going to have to know how to handle the customer. When you're calling some of these, you know, notice of defaults and things like that, you're going to have to know how that process works. You're not just going to walk into a situation where the person's motivation is going to essentially make your skill set, your skill level almost irrelevant. You're going to have to know how to get the deal done. That's what coaching is all about. You all know that. That's the reason hundreds of you are joining our coaching program every month. And it's not too late for you as well. This is the perfect time of year to join coaching. That way you can get a jump on to next year. Text the word Premier to 47372. Text the word Premier to 47372. Text the word Premier, P-R-E-M-I-E-R, to 47372. And you can be on your semi-private coaching call with your hair certified coach today. Um, and the first thing we want you to do, and as soon as you log in, it takes you 22 seconds to join. And as soon as you log in, download and complete the real estate treasure map. There's a lot of pages to it, so make sure you got a lot of paper in your printer. But do take the time to actually print this out. Completing the real estate treasure map will give you a huge feeling of relief because all the things that give you the real estate night sweats, the uncertainties of your finances mainly, those are all going to be on paper. You're going to see them all in front of you. And then the real estate treasure map is also going to help you create a plan to make it so you don't have to feel anxiety going forward. It's incredibly important that all of you do that. Don't wait until next year. Do it now. Text the word Premier to 47372 or just go to members.timandjulieharris.com, members.timandjulieharris.com. Remember when texting messages may apply. All right, Julie, part one. Yes, so we're talking about will skyrocketing housing inventory wreck the market? That's what all the headlines are trying to convince you of. And this is part one of a multi-part series. So here's the question. Are we actually on an all new crazy train destined to crash off the cliff in a pile of short sales and foreclosures? That's what headlines would have you believe. Are, you, are distressed sales headed to your market? Is the bubble bursting? Well, do you feel confused and stressed yet? We do. <laughs> okay. So let's drill down on what's actually happening, what it means, and what you should do about it. Our eight-year-old would call that facting. <laughs> so inventory is rising. That's a fact. The headlines say that the influx of active listings will drive prices down, reduce the velocity of sales, and consequently wreck the market. Now, this is indeed a logical arg argument because it was a major factor driving the housing crash of 2008 and 9. Too much supply and not enough demand turned the tables from boom to bust back then. That is true. It's true that inventory has increased from an all-time low of 900,000 active listings in February of this year to a new high of 1.2 million listings currently. That's an increase of 35.6% so far this year. So that's a fact. Inventory is rising. But what does that mean? Consider the fact that active listings peaked at 3.9 million in 2006, just before the housing bust. We have 2.6 million fewer than that peak, so this time is not just like that time. It's very unlikely that we will all wake up to a sudden increase of 2.6 million listings. No, it's very unlikely. That, <laughs> unlikely. Yeah, unlikely. You, yes, you, unlikely. Sorry, you wrote I, read, unli I, I read it wrong. You wrote, you wrote unlikely, but you said likely. Yes. So there's no chance we're going to wake up to 2.6 million uh, additional listings. Now, But why? But why? So here are the eight reasons why we won't have an inventory Armageddon anytime soon. By the way, Julie, 
That would be a very good clickbaity title. Thank you for that idea. <laughs> no problem. Point number one. I'll read this first one. Okay. Builders have slowed their production. And already, well, I heard that uh, builder confidence is like, again, I mean, again, dramatic headline, right? Yeah. Builder confidence is like a 25-year low and they're not planning on doing yep. any starts and blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, builder uh, confidence or builders have slowed production and have already taken drastic measures to sell off existing inventory spec homes. The bottom line is they won't be flooding the market with new construction. Housing permits are already down by 11 0.4% for single family residences. Julie and I shared the story with you guys on this pod of when we were driving, this was back, I think it was 09 from uh, Las Vegas to Laguna beach. And we passed the sign in Victorville, California. Mm -hmm. It was a big, huge billboard, which was, I mean, frankly, it looked a little weather, weather worn at that point, but the builder was advertising, buy a house, get a house for free. And that really did happen. That's not going to be happening in this market. So just don't, you know, right. essentially don't think that's going to happen because it won't. And the builders actually have a hell of a lot more flexibility for the most part, especially if it's a large builder. Like I'm thinking of our friends in Ankeny, Iowa, who mm -hmm. work with a lot of large national builders. The builders have owned that land forever. The builders a lot of times have bought the construction supplies, you know, months ago, if not years ago. So they actually have a lot of flexibility to lower prices and be far more competitive than resale homes. So just FYI. Well, so that point goes directly to supply and demand. One of the problems in the last go around was that it had been massively, massively overbuilt. You remember driving through Las Vegas and entire subdivisions of half built homes were, had chain link fence around them with a giant padlock because the entire neighborhood had been foreclosed on. There simply isn't that inventory out there to have that happen. And there won't be. So point number two, <clears throat> excuse me, inventory increased last time largely due to factors that are not present in today's market. We're not gonna do all those factors in this point, but for example, have you ever heard of a ninja loan? Well, that's a mortgage somebody could get, even though they had, here's the ninja part, no income, no job, or assets. That's just one risk factor that does not exist in today's market. So, and again, we could go on, that could be a, a separate podcast you in could, itself. You guys can do homework on uh, all the craziness that was going on back during the housing bubble. The bottom line is, is that none of it is, in, is factored in. There's no craziness that went on with mortgages. Uh, the Dodd-Frank bill, the uh, you know when they revived, uh, none of those guys are senators anymore, but they went through the whole uh, you know financial industry and really put minimum standards for loans and mortgages. And for the most part, and there were some mortgages that originated, and I don't think it was that many, the beginning of this year that are probably too low of down payments, like 3% down payments. But even those uh, owners are you know safe because the appreciation year over year has been 19% nationwide. And because they had to do things like you know document their job. Right, exactly. Well, the point being is there's, no, there's not a lot of these janky loans like there are out there before. Um, so let me just drill down on that just one last point. Because Julie and I were coaching agents all over the country when this actually happened. Mm -hmm. So what was what happened is a lot of people went into what they didn't know were subprime loans. These ninja loans were subprime loans. And generally speaking, there were short-term adjustable loans. A lot of people did interest only. Where they, and I've seen some, uh, by the way, I've seen some non-conforming jumbo mortgages being offered that are uh, interest only. Anyway, that aside, so you, you had a lot of people that had interest only short-term loans, sometimes two years, three years, five years. And as those loans adjusted, or as those loans came due to adjust, there was no uh, mortgage available to that borrower that was going to make it so that their payment was going to stay the same. So the a loan was adjusting from, say, you know, uh, what it amount to maybe 4% or whatever the hell it was, all the way to maybe significantly more than that. Bottom line, their payments were going through the roof. And at the same time, all the other houses in these neighborhoods were also experiencing the same thing, or a lot of the houses were. And these owners were all realizing, well, we don't have the ability to refinance these houses. There's no equity in these houses. And that's what caused people to start abandoning their houses. It wasn't because there's a lot of bullshit out there where people are saying people abandon their houses because of the fact that they owed too much. That wasn't what happened. They abandoned their houses because they couldn't afford the payment and there was no loan out there to essentially replace the ninja loan or the adjustable rate loan. Their new payment was something they could not afford and unemployment was close to 10%. So they're probably worried about their ability to make the payment as well. That's one of the future points. Okay, so point number three, adjustable rate mortgages caused homeowners to no longer afford payments. You just talked about that and not to be able to refinance out of that situation. Now, keep in mind, the whole world has already refinanced down to super low rates that are locked in, but just under 10% of existing mortgages, and I checked this up to date as of yesterday, are adjustable, and more than 50% of homeowners don't even have a mortgage at all. And in 2008, 80% of mortgage loans were adjustable in some way. Okay, maybe that was an adjustable rate, maybe that was an ARM, 
but they were adjustable. 50% of homeowners who have mortgages right now have more than 50% equity. This is, so we have a combination of factors. You, actually, that little stat right there, I have never heard before. So that's very fascinating. In 2008, 8% of all mortgage loans were adjustable. So let's break this down. I'm going to essentially you know, round things off. Of all the homes in the United States, 50% have no mortgage. Uh, the other 50% that have mortgage, uh, most of those are locked in. 90%, according to Julie's research, are locked into long-term 30-year fixed rate mortgages. So if they bought those houses any time before, say, March of this year, their rate on those houses is probably less than 3.5%. Yes. Uh, we know people who have mortgages in the 2%, and some, some of you might be having loans in that, that range mm -hmm. as well. I'm going to give you a little advice from your wise old Uncle Tim. If you have a mortgage that's less than 4% or less than 3.5%, do not sell that house. I don't care. Do not sell it. Keep it as a rental. Do not sell it. That is free money. When the when the inflation rate is 9%, and some people, and I would frankly agree with them, it's more than double that, is let's just stick with 9%, and your mortgage is less than 3%, that's called free money. Your house is inflating in value more than the cost of the loan. You're actually, uh, as far as the bank's concerned, they're losing money on your loan. Do not sell that loan no matter what. If you want to buy another house, save up money. You know, sell the beer can collection, whatever, right? Don't buy a boat. If you want to buy a new house, uh, save up the money, keep the old house, make it into a rental property. That will be one of the smartest things that you can do. Again, just don't forget that. I know I'm going to, if you know people listen to us, they pass that advice along. That's going to cost some agents some listings. You choose how to use this information. I'm suggesting this to all of you. That way you've got another pass, a path for wealth building from the investment prop or your home that now becomes an investment property. That, is, that aside, okay, so 50% of all the homes have no mortgages. And 90% of the, and the other 50%, if 90% of those have super low rate uh, mortgages, that means only 10% of those loans are adjustable. And if you look at this in actual terms of numbers, of all, even of those 10%, most of those owners, unless they bought in like the last, really, I would say six months, most of them are going to have at least 20 to 25% equity in their mm -hmm. homes. So in order for them, follow me on all this logic, guys. Argue in comments or chat or message me on Instagram. I'm looking for information to counterbalance what Julie and I are seeing because no one's telling you guys the truth. Everybody's saying, huge increase. I got a, a BS email the other day. Someone mm -hmm. trying to sell some silly short sale designation. Yes. And there it was like, huge, in yeah, I sent it to you. huge increase and the amount of uh, like whatever the hell it was, defaults or whatever, or some, you know, gratuitous headline. And then you click on it. There's no facts. There's no figures. No. Don't, there's no information reinforcing it because it's a lie. Or it's huge because there were five and now there's seven. I guess right. that would... Percentage that's... wise, that would be a giant increase. Exactly. So you guys got to be really careful what you're reading because that's going to adversely affect your mindset. If you believe the sky is falling and houses are going to drop in value, you're probably, because you're you know wanting to do the right thing by your buyers, you're probably going to be kind of worried about you're going to sell them something that's going to lose value and they're going to end up in a you know financial mess. Well, that's not the case. As long as the inflation is in the marketplace, which is going to be for a long period of time, homes are going to continue to rise in value. Exactly. Also, everything you just said goes to why we won't have even more inventory because people know that a 3% or lower, 3.5%, even 4% or lower is something to hang on to. So point number four, unemployment peaked in October of 2009 at 10%. If you didn't have a job, you weren't going to be making your payments. And again, you also couldn't qualify to refi. The current unemployment rate in the U.S. as of yesterday is 3.5%. This is actually the lowest figure in 50 years. The number of unemployed persons declined by 261,000 to 5.75 million in September, while the number of employed increased by 204,000 to 158.9 million. So unemployment is not an issue like it was before. Now that is the that's the bugaboo though. And if you wanted to create a good argument about why there could be some sort of massive uh, you know housing crash or correction, it's the uh, the reversal of point, Julie's point number four. If there was a huge increase in uh, unemployment, if all of a sudden people couldn't um, make their payments, but I'm here to tell you that even if that does happen, that's not going to happen. And here's why. Because we have now seen in the 2008 housing crisis and during COVID what the government will do. And I know some of you get pissed off when I say this. You guys like to argue with me. I'm not, Julie and I are not saying that we like what's, what the government did. We're not pro this or anti that. 
Some of you take these almost religious lines on believing governments should not intervene when people can't make their payments, they should be out on the streets. I understand why you're saying that, but I also understand the human hardship that goes with that. My parents almost lost their house. And trust me when I tell you, there's a lot of emotional scars that don't easily go away after you've gone through a financial crisis like that. So where am I on this conversation, if you really want to know? I am for the government intervening and helping people stay in their houses. I'm for people staying in their houses and, and uh, working out you know, some sort of graceful exit if eventually they mm -hmm. can't actually make the payments. But in the interim, here's what's going to happen. The government did what, uh, in 2008, 2009, 2010, the Obama administration put in place uh, lots of programs to make it so people could stay in their houses. We knew people that stayed in their houses for three, four, five years without making payments. Again, not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that's what happened. Now, during COVID, what happened? You had mortgage forbearance. Some of you are still on mortgage forbearances. That's right. But here's a major difference. It took the Obama administration more than a year to get there because nobody expected it to happen in the first place. There were no thing, There was nothing in place for banks to even know how to deal with that. Now all of that has changed, and your evidence is all those programs from the Obama era, but also how they handled it during COVID, which I, I think really did, in a large way, uh, you know, rescue the market. Remember in early COVID where everybody thought that the housing market is over, that's it. And if you look at the charts and graphs for about one and a half quarters, it was a standstill. I remember, excuse me, going to list reports for Texas and looking at new listings. And for day after day, week after week, for about six weeks, it was literally zero new listings. And remember, during that time, you also had all these restrictions where you couldn't go to showings anyway. Agents weren't seen as um, you know essential workers. And yet, because forbearances happened and because we didn't have a big avalanche of problems, what happened? The market came screaming back as a result of that. So we have got precedence of things not hitting the fan. So here's what's going to happen. If there is a significant slowdown, and just remember we told you this because everyone else is going to be saying this uh, in 6 to 12 months. Just watch for this. If there is a significant slowdown, I promise you, no matter who the president is, there's going to be some very sensible, you know, not very difficult way of getting a mortgage forbearance because virtually all the mortgages are controlled by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. All the mortgages are controlled by the government. All the banks are controlled by the government. So the government's going to say no foreclosures. And then you have the states. Remember how the states like New York and other states were essentially said no foreclosures, period. You know, we're, moratoriums. We're moratoriums. That's going to happen again. So if things got really bad in the United States, there is not going to be a tsunami of defaults. I'm not saying again, we're not pro it, we're not against it, we're just stating what the government's going to do. Once that program is in place, or once that agreement is in place, you know, guess what's going to happen? People are going to lean into it. They're going to expect it. And right now, I don't know, this is crazy. Again, Julie and I were searching this. I mean, a lot of you will be surprised. That's the reason some of you will think it's crazy. You can call up your servicer right now, your bank right now, and tell them you've got COVID or tell them you, mm -hmm. you know, you're unemployed or you have some financial problem. They'll put your house in forbearance, your mortgage in forbearance without uh, dinging your credit. And the missed payments go on the back of the loan. So for example, and this is something else that happened, which I thought was bizarre. I mean, back when the housing market or back when COVID hit, March of 2020, and it was about, what, May or June when all the forbearance programs were in place. Mm -hmm. And you and I got onto our podcast like we are now, and we told every single agent to absolutely positively put their house and all their, if they had uh, rentals, put them in forbearance and uh, save the money and just who knows what was going to happen right, next. Right, because we're going into uncertain times because right. nobody knew. We had so many people, I shouldn't say that, we probably had over that time of doing this series of podcasts about how to put your loan in forbearance, there were so many people that were angry at us for telling agents to put their houses in forbearance. And yet, on the other side of that, a year or two later, there are so many agents now that are thanking us for having actually told them what to do and how to do it. Yes, and, and don't forget that that largely applies to rental property that people own. Uh, you remember when we lived in Las Vegas, one of our neighbors uh, was an in investor and the, the tenants used to say, well, what do you know about my owner? Because I've been thrown out of two or three other places where this the owner this, was this foreclosed was back in, on. This was back in 07, 08, 09. That's right. And so the tenants were worried that their owner was going to get foreclosed on and that they were going to get evicted because the place was going to be a foreclosure or for sale. Now, if you're a tenant, and we've actually had two of our tenants do this, you can go to different uh, entities and say, you know, I due to COVID, I wasn't making what I was supposed to make, thus I can't make my rental payment. 
and apply for that aid, and those entities will give the tenant, and they will actually pay the landlord directly to make up the rent. That None of that was in place before. So this is, this is the reason that Julie and I, oh, and we're going to give you more points tomorrow, this is the reason we cannot find any real reason to believe that there's not going to continue to be, oddly enough, a buoyant housing market. We cannot find, now, we do believe there'll be fewer home sales. Obviously, there'll be a lot of people that are, you know, realizing that they're not going to give up their super low mortgage rate and they're going to stay put. Maybe they're going to do an addition, whatever. Well, they're the super aspirationally priced have already left the market. Now we're getting down to the more serious sellers, which incidentally are a little bit easier to deal with negotiating. That's all good as well. So yes, there will be fewer sales, but the price, I didn't see anything really indicating any major price hits. And all of this, at the end of the day, all of the points boil down to simple supply and demand. The yep. demand is still there. The supply is still low. Well, you supply and demand, but you also have this odd other thing called inflation. Mm -hmm. So supply and demand will be, uh, you know, essentially the inflation is going to make the, those extremes even more so. For sure. So that's what you're dealing with. I mean, uh, we told you guys yesterday, it was amazing. Pepsi raised their price by, uh, what was it, 19%. Um, I actually researched the Ford F-150. They're supposedly raising their prices between this year and last year by 10%. You're seeing all these manufacturers of everything. So everything, basically, every single thing that you bought, you know, 90 days ago is more expensive now. Eggs are up 30%. This is all housing. Real estate is going to continue to inflate. We have not found a single report, even with the biggest housing bears, the biggest doom, you know, you know doom and gloom types. We have not found a single report where anyone is uh, predicting that there's going to be a loss in home value. There won't be as much appreciation in some That's markets. Right. It's called deceleration. Right. Not so, the same as depreciation. Right. And again, for the years, like, I don't even know how long, 50, 100 years, the average increase in value of homes was like 2 or 3% or no percent per year. So what, what we've normalized now is the expectation that a house is going to go up by 5 or 10 or 15%. That's abnormal. Those days are probably, for the most part, done, though evidently through, what was it, July or August of uh, this year, there would already been a 19% increase in home values year over year. Right. Well, so that doesn't go away if it decelerates to 3%. Exactly. That still stays there and then adds 3% to that higher value. Right. And, you know, uh, new construction, that's another reason, like, if, uh, if new construction could all of a sudden undercut the price of resale, then you could have another argument. We had somebody else that actually proposed that, to which I said, go and find me one example of anything that goes into a new construction home that's less than it was a year ago, and they couldn't, and they did research on it. And Julie and I put in our, a driveway in our cabin up in uh, North Carolina, and the actual blacktop or the asphalt cost twice as much as it, what it would have uh, cost last year. Mm -hmm. Lumber, windows, everything. So there's not going to be any kind of forced depreciation from a competitor like new construction. So what we're looking at is a long-term trend of everything increasing in price at a rate that we've never seen before in our lifetimes. All this is leading back to the fact that you guys are in the right place at the right time because you're all going to be getting raises. Yes, there's going to be fewer transactions. That I think is true. But there's the transactions you're going to do, you're going to get paid more on. I don't know about you, but not working as hard and getting paid more sounds like a good thing. What's Let's that? work more money. Right. All good. So, what's, what are you, why are agents so worried? What are they worried about? I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. I mean, you guys will be able to make more money um, helping people that are truly motivated, obviously, and at the same time doing uh, not working as much and not having to really put in. You, you're certainly not going to have a bunch of looky-loo buyers in a marketplace like this. If you're a landlord or if you're thinking about becoming a landlord, great time to do it because you're going to have a lot of people who are going to be renters for a long period of time. When Julie and I started selling real estate, um, interest rates were around seven, like six and a half, seven percent. That's when we started selling real estate, but they'd been higher prior to that. So there were a lot of people that were priced out of becoming homeowners. So a lot of our first time home buyers, when we were selling real estate in our early twenties, were actually in their mid thirties and early forties. Mm -hmm. And they've been renters for all those years because the interest rates had, had to come down to 7%. We're in a cycle like that now. That's what's going to happen. So don't think people are entitled to a house. They're not. If they want a house, you're going to have to save up more money. There's different opportunities in every single market. There's opportunities to help people, provide you have the skills that the people want to pay for. Yes, that's right. And don't forget that we have, and I, this wasn't one of the points of this series, but I'm, I'm going to put it in one of our next series. We have historically the highest credit rating and the highest savings, I think, in the history of it being tracked. 
So what does that mean? Why do you care about that? Well, don't assume that you have to put 20% down either. There's lots of good, uh, you know, what you might have used on 20% down, maybe you use on a rate buy down. You lock in a better rate for a 15, 20, or 30 year fixed because you had, let's say, an 800 credit score and you're not required to put that 20% down. There's more options. I think that some of the fear in the market right now from agents is that they're not embracing, <coughs> excuse me, knowledge equals confidence. Ignorance equals Ignorance fear. Ignorance equals fear, right? So if you have the knowledge to counsel somebody that, hey, you know what, there might be other options, ask these questions of your lender, that then your fear melts away. So I'm going to give you two examples. And these were both for people in our EXP group. I had a call this morning. What was his name? Stephen. Stephen Clark, if you're listening. So Stephen was asking me about a for sale by owner that he was uh, interested in helping and he was giving me a whole bunch of detail about the FISBO and the numbers and all the rest of it. And I said, Stephen, what is the seller's motivation? And he had to remember, remind himself what it was. She had no motivation. He basically said, she'll, she said she, she has no place to go, no time to be there, no, in, absolutely no motivation. She, she get her price, she'll sell. And here was my advice to him. Go to the next one. Don't waste your time with her. Yeah. She's not motivated. Don't waste your time with people like that in the market, on, market, on this marketplace because there's enough people that are motivated, to which he had a huge sigh of relief because he couldn't figure out how to solve the unsolvable Rubik's Cube. That's what a market like this gives you is a lot more opportunities to do business with a lot more different types of folks if you have the skill set, which leads me to another call that I did for somebody else that's in our EXP Realty group. Similar to the situation Julia was just talking about. It was somebody actually whose lender told them they had to put I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like maybe 5% six months ago, and now they have to put down 15% or something. This was in uh, California. The, the sale price, I think, was $1.3 million or something like that. And so the person was not able to come up with the additional down payment. Well, this is what I told the agent, and this was, on, uh, this was a buyer's agent. Actually, this was a listing agent who was selling the house to their own buyer. Mm -hmm. right? So I told them to find out with, from the seller – a, how much they own the property, make sure there's no second mortgages. B, would they be willing to hold um, a second mortgage on behalf of that buyer? And I think the amount was, let me do it in my head, uh, the amount would have been something like $100,000. So here's how the deal would be structured. The lender was going to give the borrower a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. The borrower had to put down uh, essentially 15%. The borrower had 5%. The seller would give the borrower a 10% second mortgage. The seller in this case, if I remember correctly, had something like 90% equity in the property. So no big deal if they didn't take another 100000 from the closing table. So the structure of the second mortgage would be that that was going to be, I think, we, this is all negotiable, right? These aren't set in stone rules. This is the way it works. A two-year, three-year, maybe even a 12-month or even a six-month balloon. So the payment on the $100,000 that the seller was giving to the buyer as a second mortgage so they could get their loan was going to be essentially, ref had to be refinanced unless the seller agreed to continue to hold it in whatever amount of time it was, six months, 12 months, two years, three years, whatever, right? That way the borrower got the loan. Now, why would the lender, why would the Bank of America, whoever do a deal like this? Because for a lot of reasons I'm not going to explain, they don't really care about a second mortgage. They care about the person's ability to make the payment and they care what their equity position is. So they're doing the loan for that borrower with a 15% down payment. Now, I will give you a little bit of color on this. If the borrower were to default um, on the first mortgage, if they were to stop making their payment, uh, aside from the, the conjecture Julie and I had about if the government would bail people out and all that, but let's just say that were to happen and they were in the foreclosure process, Bank of America or whoever the primary lender was would get paid at clo essentially at the foreclosure sale. The second mortgage holder would get completely wiped out or most likely depending on how the house uh, trans how it actually sold. A lot more detail than you need to know, but the point was that's how you can put deals together in a marketplace that, yes, like this. Yes, but here's the problem. How many agents would have the thought to even, A, ask the question of a coach? That's why we have coaching, right? right. <laughs> but also, B, to even search their MLS for things like owner financing, possible owner second, well, things like that. And they're going to ask, why would a seller do that? Well, it's because they're also making interest. But flip it on the other side, right? If you're a listing agent and you're having listings that aren't selling and you have a seller who has a lot of equity, which is all your sellers, then you can have them have this conversation with them about owner financing. They'll all agree to it. You know, obviously they're going to say it depends on how much. It depends on the borrower's ability to pay. Sure. It depends on what the interest is. They're going to want to know the terms. But what you could do is you could set that up so that the seller was getting a second mortgage or getting a loan essentially. That's the house is the collateral for a hundred thousand dollars, and maybe the interest rate was like eight or nine percent. They're not going to get that if they just stick it in the bank. That's you know, why the seller would take something right. like that. 
And by the way, guys, this is not something that you have to write up. This is something that your title company can write up and file or an attorney. Yeah. And in some states, you're not allowed to do that. Texas wouldn't let you do that on your own. So this does not mean you shouldn't pursue it. It means figure out how to do it, take a class on it, get your CE credit on it, start searching for it. You don't have to write all of that up. It gets filed as a normal lien at closing, just like a regular mortgage. Exactly. And so these are all the types of things that if your market becomes more challenging, you have to know how to matriculate within the market. And if you don't, frankly, you're toast. If all you know how to do is what you've been doing for the last few years, you're just not going to make it. Or if you do, you're going to be wishing you would have learned these skills two or three years from now, you're going to look back at your previous two or three years and you're going to wonder why, you know, Bob, the new agent has just smoked you in sales. It's because he was willing to take the time to learn the skills. It's not that difficult. And it, by the way, we did do deals like that because, oh yeah. you know, we actually sold real estate for a long time at a high level and so did all of our hair certified coaches. So if you're wondering, some of you guys are at brokerages where this just is not even going to be a conversation if we're being honest, well, because, go- because your broker, your office manager, whoever either never sold or didn't sell in a confusing market like this. It goes back to what I was saying originally, right? It's the rotten fruit thing. So if right. you're in a if you're in a brokerage situation where the broker is basically getting, you know, sweats over you explaining to them how you're going to do second mortgages and they're telling you no you can't do that. Right. If they're saying no you can't help somebody, no you can't put a deal together, uh, it, because they don't know how to do it, which is usually the case if they haven't been in the business for at least 15 years, ideally 20 or 25 years. They don't know how the hell to do deals like this. They may never even have heard of it. They, exactly. They won't even know. That's when you need to do what we call a good old fashioned broker upgrade. You need to do this before you find out you should have done it. EXP Realty, join Julie and I at EXP Realty. Consider becoming part of our EXP Realty group. That's right. We are officially applying for the job of being your EXP Realty sponsor. If you've not yet already chosen your EXP Realty sponsor, please do consider Julie and I. This is the next natural step for all of your businesses, whether you're a new agent, whether you have a team. Frankly, if you have a team or a brokerage, we need to have this conversation urgently because the changes that are going to be happening in the marketplace are going to happen faster than they did in 07 in more significant ways. And we can talk about all that on a private coaching call. If you're ready to upgrade to eXp Realty, please consider Julie and I as your eXp Realty sponsors. Text me directly at 512-758-0206. Guys, listen, I hope you all know this. It means the world to Julie and I that you're allowing us to live our life's mission of being of service to all of you. That When we say be of service to other people, the other people that we're being of service to are all of you. There's tens of thousands of you that listen to this podcast every single day. You know, our YouTube channel is picking up more people listening. We're doing this to help you. We're doing this to make it so you don't lose what might be one of the best opportunities of your lifetime because of this market. We're doing this because we've been there, done that personally and through tens of thousands of coaching calls. We know how to make it so that in this market you can thrive. We know how to help you through this market so that you don't have to feel the unneeded stress. How, Frankly, how you can avoid having all kinds of downfalls that happen from complacency and, you know, fake beliefs. This market's not about mindset. This market's about skill set. If you want to have a powerful mindset, get your skills together. When you know how to solve other people's problems, doesn't that automatically know, you automatically intuitively know you're going to feel more powerful. Focus on the practical and the tactical. Focus on the next three steps. Julie and I in our coaching organization will focus downrange and we'll make sure that if there is any sort of distress that's starting to creep up anywhere, we're going to know about it. We're going to tell you. We're going to prepare you for whatever might be coming. Do consider becoming a coaching client. Please do consider joining in, uh, Julie and I at eXp Realty. It is our pleasure and our honor to continue to be your real estate coaches. If you need us for anything, you can also just text me directly at 512-758-0206. Thank you. Have a fantastic day. Hello. Thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right. And don't forget to hit that like button. Leave your comments and questions below and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're going to love that one.